published by Cambridge University Press, and I strongly urge all of you to buy. I was uh, assured by Ian that it's a short, uh, relatively short book and condensed book, uh, so uh, not nothing too scary. Uh, and the book explores the idea that cyber foreign interference in elections constitutes an assault on democratic values, which are protected by the international principle of self-determination. So with that, Professor Allen, you have the floor. Thank you so much for this uh, opportunity to visit with you virtually and to give this talk. I'm uh, very excited to be here. Um, and thank you for your, your hospitality and for this invitation. Um, as was just indicated, my talk is gonna be um, sort of inspired by the recent monograph that I published. It's, it's right here, published by Cambridge. Um, and so if you want sort of more detail about some of the uh, ideas or arguments that I um, present today, you can, you can find the answers in the, in the, in the monograph. So the, the question that I'm gonna talk about and the, the research question that's <clears throat> dominated this corner of my research agenda for the last few years is whether or not foreign election interference violates international law. Um, to me, you know, my background is as an international lawyer, or it's one of my backgrounds. <clears throat> and so the 2016 election posed a bit of a puzzle case for international lawyers. Um, you know, sort of setting aside for a second whether or not foreign election interference was damaging to democracies, um, what its causes were, whether or not it violated certain domestic frameworks. International lawyers were very much <clears throat> focused on this one particular legal question, which is, well, does it violate international law? And our collective interest was piqued, I think, by President, um, um, President Obama's uh, comments um, at the very end of his uh, presidency where uh, he specifically called out Russia for its behavior in the 2016 election. But he also seemed to go out of his way to not describe it as a violation of international law. He described it as inappropriate. He described it as a violation of um, norms of international relations, but he went out of his way not to use the label um, uh, illegal under international law. And that got me and a lot of other international lawyers really sort of thinking about whether or not it violated international law or not. And I just want to clarify that this is my, my framework because I think there's a lot of different ways that you can study foreign election interference. <clears throat> um, you can study it as a political scientist. Um, you can study the sociology of it. You can look at it through um, the information technology angle. All of those are very, you know, worthwhile frameworks. And I certainly want to bring together any insights from those disciplines into my analysis. But I also want to acknowledge that simply answering the question whether or not this conduct violates international law or not is not the only research question that one might be concerned about and others might have different um, uh, ways of looking at the phenomenon. Um, my general take on this issue um, is that most international lawyers um, had the right answer, but for the wrong reasons. So I think there's, there's a lot of conflict amongst international lawyers and experts on whether or not foreign election interference violates international law. Some say, no, it doesn't violate international law. And I certainly disagree with those. Um, but some other international lawyers think it does violate international law. And I agree with them, but for different reasons. So I think that they have the 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 way that they or the avenue that they get to that conclusion is is wrong. So what I really want to do today is sketch out why I, I end up in that place, why I think election interference is illegal, <clears throat> but for different reasons than than most people commonly assume. What I want to do here is I want to talk about basically three frameworks that you can use under international law for understanding election interference. And I want to uh, reject the first two, even though they're quite common ways of looking at the problem. And then I want to propose a third alternative, which is um, uh, overlooked in my estimation, but is actually the correct way of looking at things and has a, has a grain of truth to it. So the first two that I'm, I'm going to reject are the cyber war framework and then uh, the sovereignty framework. <clears throat> 
And then the third one that I'm going to um, posit in its place or in their place is the self-determination framework. So let me start off by saying a few things about uh, cyber war. Um, so as mentioned before that I've, I've worked on cyber war and I have uh, some essays and an edited volume on, on cyber war. And for obvious reasons, you know, scholars of armed conflict have been very, you know, animated by the possibility that war fighting has moved into the cyber domain. There's no question about that. Um, the NSA is heavily involved in, uh, you know, using cyber capabilities in an offensive manner and a defensive manner. Um, and, uh, you know, the US military has a cybercom, um, which is, you know, works in close collaboration with the NSA. And in fact, usually the director of the NSA is also the military's um, head of, of cyber command. Um, and so, it, you know, it's clear that the military is fighting in the, in the cyber domain. Um, a lot of those, uh, you know, examples are sort of, you know, well known. Uh, probably the most famous one is Stuxnet, um, you know, involving, uh, you know, intrusions into Iranian nuclear facilities um, in order to disable the centrifuges um, and, you know, by consequence, delay the Iranian nuclear program by, by months or, or, or years. But that's just one example of, um, I would say, hundreds of different cyber attacks that take place um, either by state actors or by uh, non-state actors or, 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 or criminals. Um, so, you know, how do international lawyers uh, think about uh, cyber war? <clears throat> There's a big sort of running debate over whether or not cyber war, and cyber attacks really require an alteration of the legal framework for understanding armed conflict, or whether or not the existing legal norms and principles um, are capacious enough uh, and nimble enough to accommodate uh, the cyber reality. <clears throat> and while I think there's, you know, there's still a lot of uh, a debate about how you should analyze cyber war, I would say the, the majority view amongst both states and scholars is that, you know, we should evaluate cyber war within the context of the existing legal doctrines, which have remained relatively stable, at least since World War II and possibly even going back, you know, centuries in terms of how we legally understand the institution of armed conflict and the rules for governing it. Um, you know, to, to, to sort of explain what that legal framework is, is basically two sides of the, of the field. One side of the legal field looks at when it's okay to initiate an armed conflict, when, you, when it's okay to start a war. And the answer to that question is uh, relatively simple to describe, but hard to um, apply in practice, which is that you can start an armed conflict, you can start a war if the Security Council authorizes it, or if you're engaged in self-defense pursuant to Article 51 of the UN Charter. Very controversial to apply that, but very simple to state what the what the rules are. That's one half of the domain of the laws of war. The other half of the field looks at what the rules are for conducting an armed conflict. So how does the conduct of hostilities um, uh, uh, play out and what are the rules governing the conduct of hostility. So for example, you have to limit your attacks to civilians. You, uh, I mean, limit your attacks to, um, uh, uh, to military targets. You can't directly target civilians. Civilians can be killed as collateral damage, but um, not if the collateral damage is disproportionate. Um, certain weapons are outlawed because they might be indiscriminate um, or cause disproportionate damage to civilians. Um, uh, or by treaty, there might be a specific rule banning a particular type of weapon, like the Chemical Weapons Convention, right? So those are the, <clears throat> the, the, the rules governing the conduct of hostilities. The majority rule is pretty much that you should think about cyber attacks within that existing framework. Now, why do I go at such length to sort of describe that existing um, framework? Well, the reason is because most lawyers, whether they're working for uh, a state government uh, in their foreign affairs office or the defense department, or whether or not they're independent scholars, the way they go about looking at a particular cyber attack is they ask whether or not the cyber attack um, satisfies the conditions um, to trigger one of those two domains of the, the laws of war. And 
typically what that um, trigger point is, is some sort of destructive um, capacity, um, uh, not just a capacity, a destructive effect so that either installations in the real world, sort of kinetic world, are destroyed or personnel are destroyed. And, you know, uh, to put it in a sort of non-technical, non-legal way, you know, things have to be blown up in some way or people have to be killed before those two domains of the law of war are implicated. And once there is that kind of destruction of installations or personnel, then we analyze it under the laws of war. Well, you can see quite clearly that some cyber attacks can implicate that legal analysis and can be relevant under that um, framework if the cyber attack is one that causes a kinetic effect and destroys something. So if you use a cyber attack to cause a power plant to overheat and it blows up, you know, that's a kinetic consequence um, that will be relevant under the laws of war. Similarly, if you use a cyber attack and it ends up, you know, killing someone, then that also will be um, uh, a triggering event for the, for the law of war. The problem with all of this, of course, is that when you're talking about foreign election interference, you're usually talking about <clears throat> a uh, cyber attack that doesn't involve one of those types of destruction. It doesn't usually destroy uh, an installation, a physical inst installation, or involve the killing of, of people. So what we're left with at the end of the day is that although a lot of public officials, government officials, politicians, senators, described the Russian attack on the uh, election system in 2016 as a cyber attack, as a cyber war, as an act of war against the United States conducted through a cyber um, modality, in a legal sense, I don't think that's exactly right. And we need to recognize this way of speaking as a kind of metaphor and not describing a, um, uh, a precise legal conclusion. And it's fine if you know, people wanna talk metaphorically about that. I don't have a problem with that. If someone wants to say in the political realm uh, that what happened in 2016 was an act of war against the United States or that it was a cyber war. Um, uh, that's, that's fine with me, but we should recognize that those statements don't describe a particular legal conclusion. Or if the speaker is trying to describe a legal conclusion, I would say, unfortunately, they're, they're mistaken. So this whole framework of cyber war, while I think can be quite compelling in some domains, um, is not a, a, a fruitful way of thinking about the foreign election interference um, like what Russia did in, in 2016. So <clears throat> with that framework, I think, put to the side um, and, and put in a box as a, as a nice metaphor, but not a fruitful legal um, uh, avenue, I'll come to the second framework, which I think is much more plausible, but I'll also point out some deficiencies in it. So the second framework is to talk about sovereignty. And a lot of, not just lawyers, but also politicians have framed foreign election interference as well, in general, as well as Russia's attack on the United States in the 2016 election as a violation of the United States sovereignty. That sounds like a really good idea. It sounds like a good description of what happened because you know, we're here running our own affairs and sovereignty protects um, the United States uh, from outside uh, interference. And it sounds like what happened in the election was a violation of our sovereignty. It turns out though that international lawyers um, have made a little bit of a mess of the concept of sovereignty. Um, and they've you know, kind of included a lot of technical requirements for when something counts as a prohibited violation of a state's sovereignty. And those technical details turn out to be a little bit um, of a barrier to recognizing foreign election interference as an illegal intervention against uh, sovereignty. So what do, I, what do I mean by that? Well, you know, sovereignty is this very large word it kind of dominates, you know, not only political discussions about statehood, but also international discussions of statehood. Um, <clears throat> you know, it is, you know, it's it's very controversial. The human rights movement for many years 
uh, you know, it was dislike sovereign, sovereignty because they thought of it as something that prevented human rights law from doing its work. Um, the, the great international lawyer Lewis Hankin once famously said that we should we should banish the S word from international law for forever. He sort of thought of it as a as a as a as a curse word that needed to be to be removed. Um, uh, but everyone recognizes it's undeniable <clears throat> that not only do states have sovereignty, but in fact, sovereignty is constitutive of statehood. That's what it means to be a state, is to have sovereignty. And it's, you know, it's worked into our Westphalian state system. You can't even understand the modern international state system without uh, gesturing towards sovereignty in, in some way. It's, it's, uh, it's arguably the central element of the Westphalian system. Um, the, the, the problem, though, <clears throat> is that whatever sovereignty means, <clears throat> it can't mean that a state can't act in a way that has an impact on another state. That's not what sovereignty means, because states are always doing things every day of the week that have some impact on other states and might make life go worse for other states in the kind of competition, but you don't have to be a realist to think this way, but just in the kind of global competition between states, a state might do something, it improves their existence, and it might harm another state uh, in terms of making them uh, worse off, but that doesn't necessarily make it a violation of sovereignty. Otherwise, everyone would be violating sovereignty every minute of the, uh, of the day. So the question is, when is a uh, action that has a negative consequence on another state, <clears throat> when does it rise to the level that it violates um, another state's sovereignty? Well, international lawyers have this doctrine where they talk about <clears throat> the, the principle of non-intervention, or sometimes it's also called a prohibition, the prohibition on non-intervention. So it's a, pro it's, a, it's, a, it's a legal norm which says at some point, if you've got a substantial infringement on something that another state really does as part of their own existence, their exclusive domain, um, then that violates their, their sovereignty. Um, okay, but what standard is used for saying, well, something is just an effect, which is legal, and when is something an illegal consequence that really um, illegally impacts <clears throat> the exclusive jurisdiction of the state that's that's affected. Well, there are all sorts of like little sort of technical details here and I don't necessarily want to go into all of them, but I want to highlight one. <clears throat> Ever since the Nicaragua decision by the International Court of Justice in the mid 1980s, the famous fight between, you know, uh, Nicaragua and the United States, um, uh, over you know the Contras and the kind of Reagan era policy involving um, uh, you know arming uh, you know anti-communist um, Contras um, and related interventions by the United States in Central America, um, uh, you know the International Court of Justice ruled against uh, the United States um, and caused really the United States to withdraw from international institutions in a very profound way. I mean, people sort of. You know, young people think of that as very much a consequence of, you know, George W. Bush in kind of 2000, 2008. But, you know, people, those of us who are a little bit older, remember that uh, there was this big wave of this um, starting in the, in the mid 80s during the, the Reagan administration. Um, in that decision, the World Court um, said that an, a prohibited intervention against another state's sovereignty will have a coercive aspect. And this utterance from the World Court ended up very much structuring the legal analysis going forward. So um, although it's not as if the World Court, you know, is the be all and end all of, of international law or of anything, this um, statement that they made was enormously successful in terms of structuring how people talked and understood about prohibited interventions against sovereignty. Um, and people generally assume that there must be some kind of coercive aspect to the behavior. Um, do this action, otherwise there'll be this particular consequence. There's usually a military consequence, but maybe not necessarily a military consequence, but this kind of coercive aspect. Well, <clears throat> the problem with understanding foreign election interference <clears throat> through the lens of sovereignty as a legal matter is that you have to show that usually 
Um, there might be some exceptions to that, and I'll only go into that if someone wants me to discuss that in Q&A. But usually the main route for dis, uh, demonstrating a um, violation of sovereignty is to show that there was some coercive aspect. And if you look at the 2016 intervention, the core behavior that the Russians were accused of engaging in, um, uh, you know, stealing um, the stealing of emails, right? Um, uh, hacking of emails and then dumping them. Um, running social media troll farms, spending money on both of these activities, um, you, know, uh, you know, running the International uh, the Internet Research Agency, IRA, troll farm in St. Petersburg. It's hard to describe any of these as really having a coercive nature to them. I mean, I'm not sure who exactly was being coerced, what was being threatened. It just doesn't, the, the language of coercion doesn't uh, helpfully describe what was so, um, well, uh, dangerous about the election inter interference. Um, so for, for that reason, I really think sovereignty, um, although it, it has a good sort of political ring to it, um, for, for international lawyers, it raises this, 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 this big problem. And that's why I don't really want to pursue uh, sovereignty as the, as the main way of discussing foreign inter uh, election interference. Okay, so enough talk about what foreign election interference is not, and let's get to my final solution. My final solution is to posit this third way and to talk about election interference as implicating the collective right of self-determination. Uh, under this view that I have proposed, what's wrong about election interference <clears throat> is that it violates this right of self-determination, which at its core, the right of self-determination is the right of a people to control their own destiny. And in a democratic polity, the way that that right of self-determination is actualized is through the democratic institution of elections. That's the engine through which the right of self-determination is actualized. So uh, any kind of foreign interference on an election violates that core right of self-determination under international law. Now, a brief word about, <clears throat> you know, if, if, if that seems right, and if that seems so obvious, why hasn't everyone always said that? Why isn't that, uh, you know, it, why is that a novel contribution or controversial, and why does anyone disagree with it? Well, <clears throat> the right of self-determination has this very odd place in the international legal doctrine right now. <clears throat> everyone recognizes that it's central, but they rarely invoke it in specific doctrinal controversies. Why? Well, there's a, I'll, I'll mention two sort of reasons. The first reason is that by definition, the right of self-determination doesn't just attach to states, it attaches to peoples, right? Peoples have the right to self-determination. And if they are not granted their own state already, the right of self-determination provides an argument to explain why that people maybe need their own state, either constructed out of pieces of other states, or maybe they need to gain independence through secession from a, uh, from a parent state. Um, in, in order to make that kind of transition, self-determination can't just attach to states, it has to attach to people, otherwise it just ends up um, justifying the statehood of states that already exist. But the point is that self-determination has to explain why non-state entities um, uh, uh, should be allowed to have states. And that's why it attaches to peoples. International lawyers can't stand talking about peoples because there isn't a precise definition under the law of what constitutes a people. In fact, other disciplines do a much better job of thinking about what the criteria for peoples are. Philosophers do it political scientists do it, anthropologists do it, sociologists do it, all of the you know, uh, other disciplines in social science and humanities um, you know, will engage with this question of like, well, what exactly is the criteria for, for people? Who is a people? Um, but lawyers uh, are kind of allergic to the fact that there's no sort of precise codified definition of who counts as a, it's hard enough for lawyers to figure out, well, are the, you know, is the Palestinian state a state or not? It's a very controversial question, right, um, uh, for, you know, for, for some lawyers. But then when you move away from states and you start talking about peoples, they're like, we don't really have much criteria for it. So they don't really like invoking self-determination. The second reason why international lawyers haven't really used self-determination often enough 
is because self-determination is viewed by many people as having a particular time, as having its heyday, a historic moment, and that was the period of decolonization. And they saw self-determination as the key legal uh, material that was used to accomplish the process of decolonization and colonies grant, you know, um, uh, being conferred independence from statehood and, you know, from, from, from imperial states. And a lot of people view self-determination as not really playing much of a role anymore now that the process of decolonization is mostly uh, complete. Um, but I think that's wrong. I think that self-determination actually has a very important role to play in contemporary life. And we need to dust off the, the dust from it and really sort of make, you know, uh, uh, make good use of it and um, uh, allow it to structure um, certain controversies and questions that are really best described as political controversies and not territorial ones, right? The thing about sovereignty is sovereignty is often about territory and controlling your territory. But the thing is foreign election interference is less about an infringement on someone's territory. And it's more about an infringement on their political autonomy. And I think self-determination is a great language for understanding that particular violation. Okay. To sort of further spell this out and to explain why I think foreign election interference uh, can be viewed as connected to this collective right of self-determination, the right of a people to decide their own destiny and to do it through elections as they do in a democratic system. I wanna connect all sorts of regulations that we have domestically in a democratic order to the concept of self-determination. So if you think about the machinery of democracy internally and all of the domestic rules and regulations and laws that allow a democracy to function, what justifies all of those? I'm thinking of particular of rules regarding voting. Who votes? Well, <clears throat> in uh, the United States, it's citizens. You can have a debate about whether or not um, there should be uh, a greater enfranchisement for voting and whether or not maybe non-citizen residents should be allowed to, to vote. Regardless of what your view is, or, or there, there's an interesting debate about whether felons, right, who have been released from prison, um, can states disenfranchise them by, by preventing them from, from voting. The point though, is that the polity is allowed to set this demarcation in terms of membership in the polity. And then they say insiders get to vote and outsiders don't get to vote. And you can fight about where the boundary is, but no one says there is no boundary. Everyone can vote. It doesn't matter if you're in Sweden, if you're in Canada, if you're in Australia, if you're in New Zealand, if you're in Russia, in China, everyone can vote here in our election. If you do that, then democracy doesn't become democracy anymore. Um, I don't know what it becomes, but it's not, it's not democracy. So the very notion of democracy in elections requires a boundary of the polity and requires membership rules. This also um, goes to um, campaign finance regulations. Right? So campaign finance regulations prohibit foreign spending on our elections and foreign contributions. Well, why? It's because foreigners are not supposed to be participating in our elections, not just not voting in them, but not participating in them through their financial contributions. Right? Um, well, how do you understand that? It's all connected to the right of self-determination because if we allow right, someone in you know, Russia or China or France, who's a billionaire to give a billion dollars and spend it on uh, our election, then what happens is that the election will no longer be an expression of the American people's decision about their destiny. It will become the expression of some other entities, a global entity's consideration of their future. So the thing is that self-determination isn't just uh, a concept which will explain, you know, why election interference is illegal and impermissible. It actually under, you know, it provides the foundation for all of the boundary regulations that make democracy and elections function. And I, the word that I use to describe those is boundary regulations. Um, okay, now I'll get to the <clears throat> the last point about. <clears throat> election interference. Um, 
a lot of the discussion, not so much in 2016, <clears throat> but in the last two years since the impeachment um, has to do or had to do um, you know, with Trump's behavior with regard to the Russians, Trump's behavior also with regard to the, um, uh, with the Ukrainians and the call that he had with Zelensky. And one of the accusations against Trump <clears throat> was that he had solicited foreign involvement in uh, a democratic election. And what I propose here is that this self-determination framework also helps to explain why an individual solicitation of foreign involvement in an election is so damaging. Now, I think there's, a, there's an interesting question over whether or not of any particular federal crime or criminal offense uh, applies to something like Trump's phone call with Zelensky, where he basically um, asked them to intervene in our in our election. Um, you know, and people had you know really big you know sort of debates, and they started looking at little you know criminal offenses in different places, campaign finance rules, um, uh, conspiracy. Um, uh, um, uh, extortion. Someone was very big on, on arguing that this was a, an extortion um, plot uh, with Zelensky as the victim and Trump as the, as the perpetrator. I'm not, I'm not going to commit myself to saying that either one of any of these arguments are correct or not correct, but it's interesting. These particular offenses are all sort of far afield from how we would normally describe this particular incident. And my, one of my sort of policy prescriptions going forward is that to remove any doubt, one thing that Congress could do, particularly a, a, you know, a new Congress and a new administration after 2020, um, is that uh, a new Congress and a new president should sign a law criminalizing um, the individual solicitation of foreign involvement in an election Full stop, there doesn't have to be any money attached to it, right? So it doesn't have to be a campaign fi finance violation. It doesn't matter if the person spent money, but just if an individual solicits foreign involvement in an election, <clears throat> that should be made a federal crime uh, to remove any doubt about whether or not this behavior is um, uh, impermissible or not. But the kind of larger point that I wanna, I wanna sort of end with is that I think self-determination helps explain why an individual soliciting foreign involvement in this way is so damaging. It's damaging because it prevents what elections and democracy are supposed to be about. They're supposed to be about a polity expressing and deciding for itself um, its future and the way that it wants to structure its own uh, decisions going forward. And if you allow people um, to intervene on that, either by invitation or not by invitation, the result will be some kind of other determination, not self-determination. You'll, you'll, you'll have a decision-making process uh, which, which, which doesn't really represent the, the will of the, of the American uh, people. So I think I'd like to stop there um, and you know, transition to questions and, and q and I'd love to hear your reactions and I can talk a little bit more about any of these sort of pieces to the argument that, that you have questions about or you find intriguing or you wanna push me on. So thanks for your attention, I really appreciate it. Th thank you so much, Jens. Uh, so uh, Diana will be monitoring, uh, monitoring the queue, um, but I will use my moderator privilege to just ask one question, uh, which will hopefully allow others to kind of think on their questions and raise their blue hand function to indicate their questions to Diana. Um, um, one thing that was missing from me, I think this is really, really fascinating. Um, uh, one thing that was missing for me from the, from the presentation is a definition of an election interference. In particular, um, I, I, I want to kind of pose two, two aspects to this question. There's certainly going to be certain kinds of election meddling that are not a violation even of the principle of um, um, self-determination. So when, when Trump invites Benjamin Netanyahu two weeks before the elections in Israel to speak before both houses of Congress, he's certainly interfering in, his, in Israeli elections. But I don't believe, or correct me if you think otherwise, that that is not a violation of the principle of self-determination. So where do we draw that line, line of gravity in general? And then going back to the 2016 election in uh, the United States, when, we, when, when Russia allegedly steals documents that are accurate and then releases accurate documents about um, 
without tempering in the document. So no, again, just limited to that aspect. So no disinformation, just the stealing of information and then releasing it to the public. Isn't that actually increasing the polity's ability to assess the candidates and make determination in a way that would be not against the principle of self-determination? Yeah, these are, those, those are both great questions. So uh, let me take them in order and I'll start with the, the first one. Um, so I, I'm not sure I can give an exhaustive list of every action which I would consider um, an example of foreign election interference, but I can say which of the behaviors that concern me and which I definitely think are violations of, of self-determination, I mean, uh, uh, are examples of foreign election interference which um, violate international law to my argument. I am particularly concerned with um, uh, participation in the deliberative process by foreign entities that are covert in nature, meaning they are not transparent as to the source of their participation and their identity. That's what I'm particularly concerned about, and I'm sure that those involve impermissible examples of foreign election interference. So, you know, in the case of the IRA troll farm operating from St. Petersburg, this was social media activity and the posts didn't broadcast in each post, hey, I'm a Russian. They weren't written in the Russian language. They were written in English and often with profile pictures that would make you think that this particular um, poster was someone from Arizona or someone from Texas or someone from New Jersey and not someone sitting in an in a, in a office park in St. Petersburg, Russia. And similarly with the um, uh, hacking of Podesta's emails and similar emails from the Democratic, uh, the DCCC, um, and then their release. Remember how they were originally released? They were stolen um, and then released um, before they were even released by uh, WikiLeaks. The Russians created uh, basically a fake organization called DC Leaks. Um, and they had a website and Facebook page for it and they started pushing it out to journalists in the United States. And they posed basically as a D, like a DC insider who had access to um, computer information. They were pretending to be Americans participating in an American election. That's what I think is very, very problematic. If someone in Russia wants to stand on their soapbox and say, I'm Russian and I think Americans should vote for Donald Trump, or not vote for Donald Trump, or vote for Hillary Clinton, or not vote for Hillary Clinton, that's fine. And even if the president of that country wants to stand up and say, hey, people, Americans should be voting for, for Donald Trump or for Hillary Clinton or vice versa, I mean, that'll piss off the president, but I don't think that's a violation of international law. But it's the covert nature of it by not transparently identifying yourself. Um, there's something about the, in, in, in a deliberative democracy, I think there's room for anonymity, right, in anonymous speech, but I think your membership in the political community, that piece of it can't be anonymous. And I don't think that um, someone purchasing, and that also explains why, although it might be troubling in a political sense, I don't think it's the same kind of election interference if Trump invites Netanyahu, you know, close to the election, because everyone knows it's Netanyahu and it's Israel and it's the president of Israel or the prime minister of Israel stating his views as an Israeli and people can, can, can take it or, or leave it. Um, now on your, 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 your second question, remind me just again what the second question was. I, th I think you answered it because it's about how does it apply to the 2016 Russian election interference? Is that okay, that good. Go ahead, Scott. Hi, thank, thanks. This is a great talk. Um, and I apologize, I missed like the first eight or so minutes. And so if you covered this there, you can just slap my question down. Um, but I guess my question basically boils down to like consequences because there's sort of like two steps. The first one is describing why something's wrong. And the second one is what can we do about it? And um, like, I, it's been a while since I've looked at international law in any great detail. I have some idea of like, you know, if acts of war, what you can do if there's an act of war, same with like interventions. I have, you know, some idea about the types of things you can do. I'm wondering what you think the appropriate consequences are for these types of actions and like how effective they're gonna be in the 
because my sense of a lot of international laws that applies to cyber is cyber has like been able to skirt under the table of consequences. And so it's the kicking under the table effect. Um, you're right. And um, I did not address this in the first eight minutes. You didn't miss anything relevant uh, to, your, to your question. So thanks for <clears throat> bringing that to our attention so we can talk a little bit about it. Um, you know, a general comment first about international law. International law is certainly not <clears throat> enforced the same way domestic law is enforced. Um, that doesn't mean it's not enforced. It just is enforced through much different uh, tools and their efficacy is certainly not um, on the same level as uh, domestic legal enforcement. There's no international bailiff that you can call in to seize a piece of property. Um, <clears throat> and no one would have thought that. Um, and if you do, you're, you're just sort of naive for, for, or one would be naive for, for thinking that way. Um, so of course the, the, the enforcement is gonna be decentralized. There are of course international institutions um, that frequently engage in um, you know, either enforcement actions or kind of proto-enforcement actions, uh, everything from the Security Council and so on and so forth. Um, you know, things at the UN are not likely to be, um, or certainly the Security Council is not likely to be something um, that would be relevant here if only because the major powers are likely to be the ones engaged in the election interference um, or their client states. So it's not like the Security Council is gonna get involved in something relating to either Russia or some state that Russia considers to be an ally or a client state. Um, same thing with, 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 with China. China engages in election interference. Same problem there. So we're really gonna have to rely on a lot of the decentralized mechanisms. International lawyers <clears throat> like to talk about retorsions and countermeasures as the two ways that you can sort of engage in self-help to enforce international law. The distinction between those two is a little bit uh, technical, but a retorsion usually involves something that you always have the authority to do because it's within your discretion. Uh, sort of a classic example of a retorsion is expelling an ambassador. Um, you, you don't have any obligation to accept an ambassador from another country. You do have an obligation to treat them in a certain way once you accept them. Um, but there's no obligation to accept an ambassador and you can expel them at any moment and you can expel their entire um, diplomatic corps or, or, or entourage. Um, and then there are countermeasures. Countermeasures are things which would otherwise be illegal, but if you do them as an enforcement mechanism, they become lawful under international law. Um, international lawyers are a little bit, uh, you know, obviously a little concerned about opening up a Pandora's box with uh, countermeasures, but the point is there are, you know, you know, a classic countermeasure is probably sanctions, right? Um, and I think one of the things to, uh, to notice about economic sanctions, <clears throat> economic sanctions as a kind of countermeasure have really transformed over, you know, a generation from being collective in nature to being targeted. So they used to be just, we'll do a sanction against an entire country and prevent that country from engaging in particular forms of trade. Um, but now the, the, the kind of um, modality is to target particular individuals who are culpable for this conduct so that you don't have this kind of collateral consequence on innocent um, civilians who will be harmed by, you know, not having economic opportunities, not being able to buy food, medicine, and so forth. So you, in the context of Russia, it involves going after the oligarchs, right? And so imposing particular sanctions on individuals who are either engaged in this behavior or closely connected to the decision makers. And I think that's, that's the, the way forward. Um, it's interesting, Obama, I think at the, at, the, at, at the tail end of his presidency, he did a few things. <clears throat> he um, you know, expelled um, uh, members of the KGB who had diplomatic cover, um, uh, but he was a little bit cagey about whether or not these were retorsions or countermeasures. And I think one thing is that the problem with election interference is that it's not transparent. And so ideally, if you're gonna engage in some enforcement of it, I think it's best to be as transparent as possible. And I wish Obama, when he tried to enforce these norms, had done it a bit louder and more vigorously. Um, so it sort of communicated to the world, hey, this isn't some secret you know, uh, retorsion or countermeasure. We're telling the whole world that we consider this behavior illegal. And if anyone else does it, there's going to be consequences from, from the United States. I guess uh, one quick follow-up to that. Uh, the, uh, I think you were saying the right of self-determination, which um, is what you were pushing for. Does that have any um, unique 
consequences, like potential uh, consequences uh, distinct from, you know, the sort of intervention or, or act of war, like those types of air bodies of law. I'm, I'm get, imagining, especially because if it's not as state focused, that that might change sort of like, if you're not a state imposing sanctions could be, I would imagine more difficult. I don't think it really impacts the <clears throat> question that you originally raised, which is enforcement and how the enforcement um, follows. Uh, you know, really you have to decide whether or not something is illegal first, and then you can decide how it can be enforced and which sort of doctrinal route you use to figure out that it's illegal. I don't think implicates too much um, uh, the particular way that it would be enforced, but I'll think about that some more. Great, thanks. Craig. Hi, thank you so much for this talk, Professor. Um, I'm gonna ask a much easier question. I, I was thinking about, you know, the, all the potential ways that uh, foreign actors could uh, could could uh, you know take action to to try to violate our so our right of self determination? It, can you talk a little bit about like sort of a harm requirement or the the extent? How far does the badness have to go before it should register with international law? Because I'm thinking a lot a lot there could be a lot of noise that doesn't rise to the level of oops we've got we've got the wrong president elected. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> uh, that's an interesting angle to pursue. Um, you know, I don't think, um, you know, we should be terribly concerned if, uh, you know, <clears throat> some low level bureaucrat in some faraway country posts one tweet and that's the end of their involvement. Um, and what was certainly what was problematic about the Russian intervention in 2016 was the scale of it. So I think you're, you're right to, to, to highlight that, um, you know, if if you look at um, the money that was spent and the individuals who were involved, one of the things that I think is very, you know, striking from a technological standpoint is the nature of social media is kind of a force multiplier in the sense that a few individuals, a few, yeah, it, it wasn't like two or three people, but I'm saying a modest um, uh, investment in financial capital and human resources, if that's used in the right way, um, you, you know, can have this huge impact on, on social media, in, at least in terms of volume. It's a little bit hard to, uh, of course, to trace impact in terms of, you know, people who changed their minds and voted one way when they wouldn't vote for the others. Um, you know, one of the big sort of things that the, the Russians did is they tried to um, uh, dampen uh, voter turnout in the African American community by, you know, some of the tweets talked about um, the need to boycott the, boycott the election. And so they were circulating in African American communities saying African Americans really have to boycott the election because it's just, uh, it's rigged and it's, it's illegitimate. And the way to protest the illegitimacy of the election is to decline to participate in it. Well, it, it's a little bit hard to find out, well, how many people saw one of those tweets and then said, I'm not going to go vote particularly in a country where voter turnout is, is so low. But one thing we can do is talk about the volume, just the raw volume of number of tweets followed by retweets. It was a massive wave of content that was put onto social media on Twitter and, and Facebook um, because they were really good at using bots to amplify things. So some things would be originally authored and then bots would come in to retweet it and then more things would get retweeted and they knew how to sort of put it in front of, you know, constituencies on Facebook who would, who would read it and then, and then, and then reshare it and so on and so forth. Um, so I think you're right that there has to be some, some scale. Um, I'm not sure where the dividing line is. <clears throat> if something is such a minor investment and, you know, uh, one person does it, I don't think that's, that's terribly um, uh, concerning. But one thing that I want to emphasize is that I don't think we should as we should limit ourselves to talking about harm in terms of changing outcomes, right? That certainly is the way Trump wanted to speak about it. Um, and, you know, 
he wanted to say the outcome wasn't altered because he would often say the Russians didn't do anything. But if, 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 if you got him to admit in a moment that the Russians did do something, he was inclined to say it didn't change the outcome. I'm still the, uh, the democratically elected legitimate president. And you know, even if this intervention hadn't occurred, um, uh, you know, there wouldn't have been to a change to the, to, the, to the election. And I think that's the wrong way of looking at it because when you think about deliberative democracy and the right to participate in the democratic process, there is a kind of harm there when you have outsiders participating. So it's right. I mean, one of the reasons why we have we have a rule that you know if someone's you know we, we would be troubled by someone outside the country voting, we wouldn't necessarily go to a war with it. But if you know someone in you know, in Germany cast a vote, um, even if it's not going to change the election, we would want that vote thrown out and not and not counted. Um, because it's, you know, sort of implicit in our notion of deliberative democracy. Um, and I think that's the harm. The harm isn't the change in the outcome. It's the covert and inappropriate participation. Yeah, thank you. And I think your response helped me, me better consider where I'm coming from in part, which is when does international law take notice? Do we have to wait for something truly uh, society altering to happen before those those wheels could start turning to, to prevent something or, or get in the way. Thank you. So, so I, I thought I heard the term future of democracy somewhere. Uh, can you comment on that? <laughs> yeah, so the subtitle of the book is International Law and the, <clears throat> and the, the Future of Democracy. So it's in the, the small print there. Um, you know, and th the reason that's there is because I think, um, you know, we're in a period where, um, you know, democracy is very much uh, changing. Um, and a lot of people have commented on this. I mean, you know, political electioneering <clears throat> used to just happen in person in newspapers. And then you get this era of, you know, radio and, and television. Um, and then I think what's, what's interesting is that, um, you know, the internet shows up obviously a long time ago, <clears throat> but it's not until the advent of social media, the widespread adoption of social media, the ubiquity of social media, that really democracy starts to have this heavily digital quality to it. Um, and it really is a kind of, uh, of, of sea change. Um, you know, I think you can sort of talk about, you know, communication technologies, it doesn't really matter whether or not it's, you know, in a, in a newspaper or on, in a book, or um, on a TV station or on, on, on the internet. You know, in some sense that's true, but in other ways it's not. The way people use social media has really transformed the way people engage in deliberative debates and political discussions. It's not always enriching political discussions. I mean, a lot of people have analyzed how you know, Cass Sunstein has written a lot about this. And there's a lot of people in information technology who have written, uh, and psychologists who have written about you know, how political discussions take place on social media, sometimes for the better and often sometimes for the, for the worse. People get angry very quickly. They tend to um, uh, not expose themselves to contrary views, um, in information bubbles, and so on and so forth. Um, and, you know, one of the consequences of that is that the volume of discussion that people are having on social media is increased. So, you know, it's not the same as, you know, the heavily curated um, nature of reading a newspaper. It's not like that. It's just this massive stuff. And then, you know, you can't read all of it. So what you read is the stuff that gets pushed in front of you, either through algorithms or through, um, you know, people in your circle plucking things up and then sharing them. And then um, it gets put before you, whether it's on, on, on Twitter or, or Facebook. Those are all very, very distinctive ways of, of engaging in political discussions. And one of the things that I think is very um, important about them is that there's not really any kind of respect for political boundaries, right? It's an international sphere. Language is a little bit of a barrier in the sense that if someone posts something in, in, a, not, in a foreign language, an American is not likely to engage in it. Um, but to the extent that it's posted in, in English, <clears throat> there's a kind of international nature to um, social media networks. Now, I, I, again, people tend to, 
have local social media networks. I don't mean local in a geog geographic sense, but I mean local in the sense of, you know, their community of, of, of friends or Twitter followers or people in their network. But there's just so much stuff all over the world that um, it's really, really hard to control. And, um, you know, there were, there were kind of common sense uh, regulations that you could do regarding newspapers and television statements and political advertisements, right? And you can have regulations regarding advertisements on Facebook, but I, I really don't really care so much about the advertisements on Facebook, right? I care about the posts and the content on Facebook and Twitter, and that kind of stuff is much harder to regulate. Um, one of the things that I talk about in my book as a policy prescription um, is that I would like Twitter <clears throat> to label foreign content as being foreign. I don't want them necessarily to ban it. Um, although if they want to ban it, that's, that's fine. But at the very least, I would love some kind of labeling regime so that if I'm on Twitter and I see a post, if it's not coming from the United States, I think there should be some sort of, you know, like the blue check mark, you know, but not a blue check mark, something else, which indicates to me that this has a foreign source. I think that would be that would be great. Now, of course, there's a lot of barriers to implementing it. But one thing that's interesting is that Facebook and Twitter, they're actually really getting involved in, you know, implementing regulations on their own, um, which are not legally required by the government, um, but are you know, things that they think are sensible. And I think the, the biggest example of this was yesterday. Apparently, both Facebook and Twitter took actions to block retweeting of the New York Post story regarding the Hunter Biden emails. I mean, that's just absolutely extraordinary. There's no legal requirement that they did that. Um, but both Twitter and Facebook think they need to do that in order to prevent from being used as a kind of pawn uh, to alter the, the election, either from outside actors or even inside actors. And um, it's just really, and they weren't doing anything like that in 2016. Um, so that's sort of what I mean about the, the future of democracy. That kind of stuff is, is changing. And here's an example where forgetting just the legal regulation, you're also getting private firms are trying to uh, engage in, in different actions to, to meet that challenge of the future of democracy. So we're coming up at the hour. Um, I, I personally have three more questions I wrote down, but uh, I'll have to cut it here. Um, I wanna take this opportunity to thank Professor Olin for this fascinating talk and for taking the time to answer a few questions and also to plug our next uh, session in the CACR's uh, speaker series, which will be by Professor Duncan Hollis on November 5th, just two days after the presidential election. And I cannot think of a better pairing than hearing from both professors Arlen and Hollis in a row at this current juncture in time that we find ourselves in. Uh, so thank you so mu much, uh, Professor Arlen, for, for joining us today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>